I just kind of thought I'd say something a bit more about the programming. I've been uh, really diving in and uh, having a look at what I'm going to need to be doing for the programming. And uh, I've come across a few roadblocks. Uh, it's not as easy, it's not as straightforward as you might imagine. A lot of it is straightforward in the sense that for many of the controls it's simply a matter of identifying the action, whether it's a default FSX action or an LVAR, and then just basically setting that LVAR or, or invoking the FSX action. So literally a switch. That's, that's how it is for many of the controls. Uh, what I've done is I've systematically gone through all my panels, hopefully exhaustively, actually one I haven't done, but I've gone through systematically and I've made notes it's just, you know, this is what I've got in front of me here. This is just notes on all the controls, on all the panels, and the corresponding FSX control or LVAR and what I need to do to it. I haven't done any of this yet except in an experimental way. Um, but for example, if I, if I look at the GPS panel, that is exclusively... I think it's right in to say that exclusively simply invokes the default FSX GPS controls because this GPS system is based, it essentially it's two systems combined into one. It's based on the G500, Garmin G500 which is available in, by default in FSX but it also controls the NAV1 and the COM1 radios. So actually to, to hook this up to my switches uh, is, is simple. I'll, I'll write a, a Lua wrapper for each of these switches and then just invoke that from the Linda interface. I'm going to show you a little bit about the Lin how the Linda interface works in, in a while so hopefully that will be clearer. But, there's the but. It's not that simple across the board. Let me find an example of how that's not so simple. The, the autopilot controls, for example, these ones I have to implement, these are the um, the altitude alerter, and, and I have to implement the, the functions on the altitude alerter by writing LUA scripts, and, and I haven't figured out quite what the logic is yet. It's not as simple as just finding the buttons and, and in setting a button there's some logic in there. For example, when you press the go-round switch it disconnects the autopilot mode that was in effect. It does other things like it sets a particular climb angle target and then it... I don't know what it does. I don't know what it does. It, it does some complicated sequence of events when you press go-round but it involves overriding the present currently set autopilot mode. So I have to figure out the logic there. I might take advice on what that logic is. It's, some of it's in the manual. I just need to read it more carefully. That requires a little bit more complicated stuff behind the scenes in the Lua script that I'm going to have to construct. Another example of that in spades, really. I haven't figured this out completely yet, but when I got to the ADF, controls on my GPS panel I discovered another problem. On the ADF panel three of the controls are simple toggle switches so we've got the ADF, BFO and FRQ buttons. The FRQ actually is a standby, active standby frequency swapper but the two buttons on the end we've got they're labelled FLT slash ST I'm not sure that label is correct actually I think it should be FLT ET because it stands for flight time and elapsed time and then the, the last button is set reset those two buttons essentially control some extra functionality that's built into the ADF radio panel which is a flight timer and an elapsed timer and by fiddling with those two buttons you can switch between flight total flight time and elapsed time and when you're on elapsed time you can set a countdown timer or reset the timer and that causes problems 
well not problems but it causes the programming of those switches to be not not straightforward again I need to figure out the logic the logic is documented in the manual I, I remember reading about it I didn't read about it carefully enough at the time and then figuring out how to implement that in a Lua script now incidentally in looking at uh, that ADF panel I discovered something else that ADF radio actually has a a rotary control, it's a dual concentric rotary control and somehow I missed that fact <laughs> when I was designing my panel and so I haven't got it and of course that's for setting well in fact another layer of complexity here it's it's mostly for setting the ADF frequency ADF radio frequency so it, um, and it's a dual concentric because it it lets you change the upper digits and the lower digits, that's the thousands and hundreds with the inner wheel and the tens and units if you like with, with the outer wheel or, or the other way around actually. The other thing it does is when you're in that mode where you're playing with the elapsed, elapsed timer the that rotary control is used for setting the, the countdown timer and that's a pain because because it means that somehow behind the scenes when you press the elapsed timer button and then the set button that rotary control needs to stop controlling the frequency setting and uh, start controlling the increment and decrement of that countdown timer so there again you know behind the scenes I've got to do something in, in, in Lua to make that work one of the other steps along the way to deciding to do this project was uh, I got this VR Insight panel. This is, a, I think, this is called the Multi Switch panel. Yeah, it says MS on it. So, <coughs> it's a VR Insight Multi Switch panel. It's not cheap, but it's a really good quality piece of equipment. And I got one of those, and uh, I was really excited because it's got rotary controls on it. This has got six, uh, yeah, six rotary controls, and th these are rotary encoders. So the way these work is when you move it left it, it, each click is essentially a button press and then you move it right or clockwise and anti-clockwise and it's a different button press so so it basically emulates two buttons but I thought fantastic anything that needs a rotary control like the Colesman window on the altimeter or the ra tuning the radios setting the heading bugs we can put them on a rotary control and it'll be realistic and uh, I did that and it was uh, and it was realistic it was great but I immediately discovered there's a problem <laughs> there's always a problem the problem you're going to find is when you set that up on something like the heading bug on the HSI or the OBS on, on one of your VORs you're going to find it's really it's really slow the, it, it, it's very it's a very nice action. These are very high, well, not very high quality. They're high quality. They're sufficiently high quality rotary controls, uh, but it's really slow. You can move it precisely, but to move it through, let's say, 180 degrees, it's just painful. And uh, this will be familiar to you if you have the. Oh, that's not supposed to be still plugged in, but it is. If you have the SciTech multi-panel. This will be a very familiar problem to you because uh, changing the heading bug using this knob, this looks like a dual concentric rotary control by the way, but it isn't, that's fake. But uh, to changing the heading bug using that or changing the altitude settings for the, the other modes, you know, it's just, it's just uh, not practical. Same problem. Uh, now, if you look behind the scenes, there's a little glimmer of hope because uh, what you find is, if you look up what controls are available to be mapped onto these buttons and knobs, for many of these situations, including the OBS and the heading bug, you've got a increment and decrement function, but you've got an increment and decrement fast function, which you know typically might. If it's if it's the regular function, it might increment and decrement values by one. If it's fast, it might be by ten. Or if it's uh, 
in terms of altitudes it might be by hundreds and thousands. Great. Um, Great-ish, because um, the, the problem then is what do you do with that? Now the simple, the simple answer is for the VR inside you could use two knobs. Uh, if you, let's say it's a heading bug, you want to increment it you know, with fine control, you use, the, you use that function. You map another knob if you want to increment it by quickly or using cor coarser control if you like. And that works, nothing wrong with that, but it's, but it's not very satisfactory. And of course, if you want to do this for your heading bug, VOR1, VOR2, ADF card, that's four at least. So you need eight rotary controls already. Uh, now there's other solutions to this which are more sophisticated. If you know it, if you're familiar with FSU IPC, you might or you might not be uh, aware that there's a slightly advanced way of using buttons that, uh, in fact you might know this from something like if you've got a, a SciTech yoke or a CH yoke, I, th I think if you use the proprietary programming packages there is the idea that you can use a button as a shift button so in other words you can modify the, the action of a button according to whether another button is held down or not so if you've got your SciTech ProFlight yoke there's a, thing, there's a mode switch on the back and uh, that's got I think three modes uh, and all it's doing is if you look at what's happening in the Windows control panel test page for that controller you'll see that according to that setting of that mode switch basically one of three buttons is actually held down so FSU IPC has a similar function allows you to program compound button operations so, so one way of doing this is let's say coming back to the heading bug you could hold down a button and twist the knob or release the button and twist the knob and thereby getting two different functions. You know, it's moving in the right direction. Still not very elegant. You could do it with a toggle switch. You toggle the switch and it's now button operates in precise mode. Toggle it the other way and the button operates in coarse mode. Again, a very obvious fudge, but somewhat usable potentially. And then, of course, I remembered and or I noticed that uh, these rotary controls have a, a click, and I thought, oh, fantastic! I knew there was a kind of rotary control that has a, a button, a, an extra button click integrated in just that way. So I thought that's the answer. The, um, the rotary control operates as I've described. If you hold it down and and, and turn it, that's your shift key. So you've got course, control, let's say unshifted, fine control if you push and turn, or probably vice versa I think. Now the problem with that is these <laughs> the VR Insight rotary controls don't seem to work that way. I think it's a fair bet if you opened this up and looked at the looked at those components, they would actually have the the, the button, the, the extra switch on, on them, but for some reason they're not wired up, oh, which is really hard to understand why they've done that. You know, the only thing I can, the only thing I can imagine is either I'm missing something and there is a way of doing that, or it's something about the total number of buttons. You know, on a traditional joystick controller, you can't go over 32 buttons. I think on, on using the modern APIs, you can go up to 64 buttons. Maybe this has got more than 64 buttons, if you, if you count them all off. I don't think it has, but <coughs> that's all I can think of. Anyway, I knew that's possible to do, and I remember the Leo Bodner, for example, looking at the, um, the components that, that are available to, to plug into the Bodner boards. You, know, you could definitely get those rotary controls. That would definitely be this ideal solution. And that just pushed me another step further towards doing this properly. Um, 